There are so many teen suicides right now from really well-to-do families. And the biggest lack, they say, is connection. Parents didn't know that their kids were anywhere near that. So we need to check in with our kids every day when we have time to pay attention to them and we can make them feel like we're listening. We're not just doing the dishes, unless that's the time when, I mean, sometimes kids feel more comfortable, especially teens, if you're actually working side by side, that's okay. As long as you have the bandwidth to, to just be with them for 15 minutes, 10 minutes a day, it makes all the difference. Hello and welcome to the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. We're here to help you navigate life while disrupting the status quo. Our discussions cover a number of topics relevant to everyday life. We discuss everything from relationships to entrepreneurship. We also engage in some difficult but important conversations. And now, here are your hosts, Brian and Tanya Hamilton. Welcome to episode 27 of the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. On today's episode, we're joined by Margaret Borsma, founder of Creative Education in Action, for a discussion centered on supporting learning for children, both at home and in the classroom. Before we get into today's show, I want to highlight our collaborator, MMC. MMC has developed sensory products for individuals of all ages. Their goal is to create neurodiverse spaces readily available to everyone. To learn more or to check out their back-to-school specials, visit mymmc.ca. And now let's get into our discussion with Margaret Borsma. Margaret, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So we're looking forward to, uh, to what you have to share with us. But before we get really into it, I would love to find out who is Margaret. I'm a very passionate person about teaching and about children learning in the best way that they can. I had a really hard time, struggled at school a lot, and I wanted to change the way things were taught. And so I spent my career teaching and developing units of work that are super engaging for children and engage their emotions. And I think once emotions are engaged, cognition begins. So I'm a super passionate parent. I have a 25 year old and, and I love working with teams in, in organizations too. So my big, my big thing that I'm up to is a social and emotional learning or developing emotional intelligence amongst people. And you work with parents? along yeah. with teachers too, right? Yeah, I, I love like coming into a whole staffs and staff rooms in schools and, and uh, providing um, professional development. But I also work with parents. I mean, the children are our home and, and the parents are the key nurturers. So of course, they need to be brought on board. <laughs> and you haven't been doing this for just a short time. You've been around for 35 years, you said? Yeah, that was in the classroom. And uh, the last seven or eight, I've been doing this creative education in action. So I became an entrepreneur. And as a lifelong learner, there is a lot to learn when you're trying to get your messages out there. And I've developed programs and now I'm getting on your podcast to, to encourage and support people. Perfect. So I just want to take it something I read in your blog, and it was posted on LinkedIn the other day. So it says teachers often find their students in the first three states of dysfunction, struggle or traction. We all want our students to reach their full potential and to thrive. Teachers must thrive as well. What is missing? And how do we get there? And then I guess it's not just teachers, the parents too, who are teaching also need to feel that they're in that position that they're thriving along with their kids. So I would love for you to share with us, how do we get there? All right, maybe what I could do just to back up a little bit is I, I have a little self-assessment for, for parents. This is from the parent perspective. I have one for teachers as well. And, but I think teachers will relate to this as well. And just, it's just like three or four minutes, I'm gonna be asking some questions and just, you can self-assess where you're at as a parent or, or even as a teacher with this, with this simple tool. So I'll start. So the first state is a state I call dysfunction. And dysfunction means there is very low potential for connection and a detrimental state of general well-being. So you know you're in this state when your children wake up tired, unable to pay attention. They may have crying spells or scream at each other. They have tense bodies and trouble sleeping. They lack motivation or procrastinate. 
and they lash out with shouting, hitting, or are withdrawn and quiet. And they may be constantly on screen, either television or computer. And you as the parent are constantly busy juggling to keep all the balls in the air while feeling frustrated and guilty because you're not meeting the emotional needs of your children. So basically your children exhibit behaviors of upset and you feel responsible for their emotional wellness. So the second state is a state I call struggle. Struggle means there is some potential for connection and general well-being. You know you're in this state when your children do some of their schoolwork every day. They ignore siblings, struggle with the odd meltdown, but it's not constant. They help you, um, they ask you to help with tech issues and schoolwork and relationship issues. And they get outside at least once a day, including physical exertion. And you are able to find some time to listen to your children attentively, but not a lot. Basically, your children need your daily help with relationship issues and lack motivation in schoolwork. The third state is a state I call traction. Traction means there's a mediocre potential for connection with your children and you have a sense of overall well being. You know you're in this state when your children have a project that captures their attention and initiate working on it. They have friends that they stay in touch with, even though it's remotely. Their eating and sleeping routines are healthy. And they are fine with, with seeing, or you're fine too, with seeing the more human side of you. Like just, you may have to display sadness more often because it's a pandemic and, and parents can't always hide their feelings from their children, of course. And you are able to do most of your work feeling like you can cope. So basically things are tolerable with routines and there is a constant busyness to keep things going. Then there's a big gap before the fourth state, and that's the optimal state. The final state is a state I call thriving. Thriving means there is full potential for connection and a sense of empowerment and well being. You know you're in this state when your children use practical tools to manage their own stress and relationships. They usually think from a positive perspective, nurture their own relationships. They're curious and excited about their learning. They're motivated to make a difference for others. They set goals, seek feedback, and self-assess. And they enjoy spending time with the family. And you have time to do your own work and energy to address needs. You see yourself as a facilitator of family life, sort of like a guide on the side. So basically, your children nurture their own relationships and love learning. So that's the optimum state. Did you see yourself in one of these states? Mm -hmm. your, your parents do, <laughs> so don't tell me which one. Just let me know if you saw yourself in this no, state. No, for sure, Definitely. for sure. Okay, yeah. good. So most of us do, we see ourselves in the bottom three states and we'd all love to be in the top state of thriving. So how do you get there? And this is where I can pr provide a, a little bit of um, practical, strategies right now. So there's a few things we can do to get to the state of thriving. You wanna hear what they are? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we have to realize that as human beings, we just all wanna feel heard and understood. And when things are stressed, that's the first thing that seems to go out the door, really making someone feel heard. And so then the smallest thing can cause them to be activated or triggered. I like the word activated because it doesn't remind me of guns. Um, <laughs> so the first thing that we need to do is learn how to do reflective listening. So I'm going to give you an example. First of all, I should have brought these glasses. I have funny glasses from the dollar store that I, that I teach teachers this activity. And I also teach students this. And basically, it's your perspective is your truth. And we all wear funny glasses. We all wear lenses, colored lenses. And we get them when we're young, like between four and five. It, it actually happens when something happens either in the family or somewhere where you feel as a child that you're, you're not in total control and you make it mean something about yourself and often about the world. So, for example, if one of your parents walked out and, and didn't come back and we're very egocentric at that age, so then we might say to ourselves, I'm not lovable. 
And we go through the rest of our lives with that lens on looking for evidence for I'm not lovable. And we end up ruining relationships that come into our path because we have that perspective, but it's truth for us. And we, each of us have something like that. For me, um, my first day of school in kindergarten, I had a broken arm and was my dominant arm. And the teacher asked us to draw a picture exactly like hers. And she drew an apple on the board and colored it in. And everyone around me had beautiful apples and I was doing it with my non-dominant arm and mine was a mess. So to me, that was evidence that I wasn't smart enough. And I went through life with the lens on that I'm not smart enough. And doing that was almost a self, self, self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. And I would look for evidence that that was true and ignore evidence to the contrary. And I think right there, like that was kindergarten, right? Yep. And look at how that still is something that you think about and you know like you remember that right over something so little I know that sometimes gets a little worrisome because like oh goodness if one of the kids start dwelling on something it's like oh gosh I hope this isn't going to be something that snowballs and becomes you know a concern or an issue down the line right yeah so and as parents we we have all those hopes and we and we're we feel at a loss as to how we can deal with it right so if you notice something like that in your child you can actually dispel it Mm. you have to know how yes you want to know how yes please (laughs) (laughs) you have all the answers today (laughs) well i don't know um so what you have to do is you have to have a moment of calm with the child and and then you say you know after they're say they've been activated because they've been reminded of that belief that they have right then you have to get them to a state of calm before you can problem solve So say, for example, Mary wants to interrupt all the time. And, and when she doesn't, when she's not able to break in, she cries and she cries quickly because her attempt to get into the conversation is thwarted right away. And that triggers her and she may have lenses on if she gets triggered right away and and she, her emotional temperature goes from zero to 10 instantly that's a sign that she's been activated and we all have that right we all have times when we get activated and our our reaction is bigger than the situation calls for so in mary's example mary wants to interrupt and she gets put down by the adult maybe and then she she starts crying loudly like she's very um hurt by that so for so we have two problems One is the emotional temperature needs to be lowered before you can ever start problem solving with her. And as adults, we forget that. And so we always ask, well, why did you cry like that? She doesn't know why she cried like that because she was activated. And when she's activated, her amygdala, which is the center part of the brain, if this is the amygdala and this is the frontal cortex, this part here, the amygdala is in charge of survival. And so the fight, flight, and freeze mechanism in her brain is totally activated and she's not able to access her frontal cortex, which is the the judgment, the planning, the decision-making rational side of her. So when we ask her in that moment, why did you punch Tommy or why did you start crying like that? She's not able to answer that. Instead, we have to calm her down first. So we might want to paraphrase what she said. So you might say something like, Mary, I I understand that you had something important to say. And then also tell her how she might be feeling about it. And it, it sucks not to be heard when you need to be heard. Or it, if you don't like that word, just whatever it was that she's feeling, you're feeling really frustrated right now. Okay, so you have to paraphrase what she's saying or indicating and how she's feeling. And then her emotional temperature starts to calm down. And she might say something like, yes, but every time, blah, blah, blah. And then you have to paraphrase again and also state how she's feeling. And then she'll come down a little bit more. And that can take several rounds and patience. But eventually you watch her emotional temperature come down to calm. And sometimes that requires a little bit of a, a break. So maybe come back in an hour. And when she finally is calm, then say, you know what? I really want to 
problem solve this because it's it's not fun to be activated and we all have that sometimes so are you are you willing to explore that with me and then you can say to her in that situation just before you started crying loudly what were you thinking because there's a thought that happens before the emotion kicks in and that is because she's making a making meaning of something that happened so she so what happened is parents were ignoring her when she wanted to interrupt and then you can actually get her to say what exactly was said you said i couldn't interrupt okay so th- What was your thought when I said that? Okay, get it right down to the thought. I didn't think you liked me. I didn't think what I had to say was important. I didn't count. You might get to that because that is in essence what usually happens. And then you can work with that. You can build her up and you can separate what happened and what she made it mean. And once we get to separate the event from the meaning, then the world is open to us. You may have to go through that a few times with her um, before she stops being activated in those situations. But because you're role playing with her and you're practicing with her, she will be able to access that new learning down the road. That's funny I, that you say that because I was just thinking, I'm like, it sounds like a lot to have to do, right? And you use the word patience for us mm-hmm. parents. Yeah. But I think over time, once you do this and this becomes a regular way of dealing with the conflict that they may be having or whatever it is, then the hope would be that they're able to work through that. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I get it. And for everybody else, it's like, okay, that's a lot. It seems like it's going to take a lot of time, but yeah, you start and you, you know, you try to use those steps in those situations. That's how you do it with adults too. It, yeah, it's true. You, you really do. And, and you have to, if you don't want to have the situation repeated again and again and again, and, and most of us ignore how often it happens, but it happens so often and it drains your energy. And if you want to stop the pattern, you have to be conscious about how you're dealing with it and deal with it. <laughs> and, you know, if we're fed up, then, then we will look for ways of dealing with it that work. It takes a little bit of practice. But um, honestly, there's just two things to remember. Paraphrase what they're saying and how they're feeling. That helps. That's it. Simple. I made it sound complex because I was explaining every step. But paraphrase, and then they feel heard. And all we ever want as humans is to feel understood. For sure. Right? So this leads me into the kind of words we can use with our children. We can use disconnecting words or connecting words for the same incident. So I'll give you an example. I might say, stop crying and tell me what you need. Well, those are disconnecting words. And all we really need, especially during stress times, such as pandemic, we need to feel connected with our, with our tribe. Connection is, is critical. If there's nothing else that we do, we all need to feel connected. And we, may, we need to make sure that our children feel connected um, with us or with their friends or both, Um, it's, I think it's critical that every child and teenager has a daily check-in with, um, with an adult. It could be the caretaker in the school. It doesn't matter. Some, somebody who will pay hundred percent attention when they ask this question and listen to the response. And the question is, how are you feeling today? There are so many teen suicides right now from really well-to-do families and the biggest lack, they say, is connection. Parents didn't know that their kids were anywhere near that. So we need to check in with our kids every day when we have time to pay attention to them and we can make them feel like we're listening. We're not just doing the dishes, unless that's the time when, I mean, sometimes kids feel more comfortable, especially teens, if you're actually working side by side, that's okay. As long as you have the bandwidth to, to just be with them for 15 minutes, 10 minutes a day, it makes all the difference. So here's the, here's the way you could do the connecting part. So the disconnecting words in that st- situation was stop crying and tell me what you need. So connecting would be, you would like me to listen and you sound frustrated. I mean, that would have been an easy thing to do for Mary, right? You would like me to listen and you sound frustrated. Paraphrase what she wants and how she's feeling. 
easy. All right, a disconnecting example. No, I don't wanna hear that whining. It's not pleasant, okay? That's disconnection and it's judgmental. What we want to say is, I'd like to hear you. Come, sit next to me. That acknowledges need and it's an invitation to connect. I'm right here. There's no reason to whine. Come on, I can't understand you. That's minimizing, judgmental, and blaming. Instead, let's try again. Take a deep breath. So there you're, you're communicating that you're okay with where your child is right now. Don't demand and focus on regulating the emotion. So don't be demanding and do focus on regulating the emotion. Okay, so take a deep breath is a way of regulating emotion. Um, and the last example, disconnecting words. Next time, use your big girl words or no one will wanna help you. That is inducing shame, guilt, and a punitive con consequence. No one will wanna help you, which equals fear. We don't wanna induce fear in our children. We have enough of that going around now. <laughs> so instead say, I can help you best when you use your words. Let's try that next time when you feel upset. You can take a deep breath, ask for a hug, draw, dance your feelings out. We'll talk more about that. So offer to help and, co and cooperative solutions equals quality feedback and connection. So hopefully that helped explain the first part a little bit better. Yeah, definitely it does now. I actually want to delve into uh, the, the last thing you said there a little bit more, the, the dance the feelings out. <laughs> All right, so last year when the pandemic hit and all the schools were canceled, I thought, oh my goodness, all our students are at home. What can I do for them? And so I created a set of five or six videos, 20 minute videos, and they're lessons like this, but for kids, because I've taught this stuff to kids before, but I do it through the arts. So it's so, I have them dance their feelings out and I have great music with it and they dance their feelings or they interpret the music and it makes them forget about whatever was happening around them. So it's a strategy I use, but I use it in a context. So every lesson is built around a rich text picture book and a, a little story. And then we do drama, we get into role, we practice this perspective taking we make puppets, sometimes out of vegetables. We draw our feelings out. So it's a wonderful resource for parents and teachers both. And it's called Deep Learning at Home and it's free during the pandemic. So you can find it on my website. Perfect, and we'll have all that information. Um, one other thing that you had said there towards the end about the connection, right? At yeah. this point during this pandemic, sometimes even myself being at home with the kids all the time and pretty much being available to them. You're just so busy going on with the day, making sure everybody gets their schoolwork done, you know, making sure they're not in front of the screens too long, just all this, that, and the next thing. And I sometimes find that like, I take advantage of the fact that we are present together. We are all under the same roof, but that connection, right? And, you know, a day will go by and it's like, geez, did I ask, you know, how are you feeling? Or, you know, however I would put that question into play right. because you almost take advantage of the fact that you're there, right? But then mm -hmm. with that comes things, you know, what they may be going through and nobody's given them a chance to share that, right? Mm -hmm. So that yeah. was a big, that was a big one for me is just like making sure even though we're together literally all the time, have, continuing to have those conversations for them to feel yeah. that connected. You connection. make a good point because being together under one roof does not mean being connected, mm -hmm. right? So being connected means really uh, an emotional connection where you can actually let your guard down and be open and be feel accepted. Yeah, no, that was good. Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> <laughs> goals. I thought I'd talk a little bit about how to achieve goals because it's, it's uh, challenging during the pandemic, especially for parents and teachers. They are forever doing everything and they're busy juggling all these balls in the air and trying to keep them up there. And, you know, if they have something big that they have to do, it can feel overwhelming. So, and I teach this to children too. There's a lesson 
I think it's lesson four, talks about, you know, what do you do when you're feeling stressed and overwhelmed? And it's based on a beautiful picture book called Whimsy's Heavy Things. So basically in that story, the advice is to break the task into small bits and not expect yourself to do it all at once. So, but I want to give you a, a little deeper strategy as parents. And I think older kids can learn this too. So usually when we, when we think of uh, something that we really want, we feel like, or we want to do, we feel like we need to have something first. So for example, you might say, I wish I had money so I could go on a vacation when the, ta- when it's, when the borders are open or whatever, so that I could be happy. So you want to have money so you can do the vacation so you can feel happy okay and that isn't really how it works that's not an empowering way to really make it work so how do you how do you be successful so you have to reverse it it's really the be do have you have to be in the mindset first so be happy first your happiness does not depend on your outside circumstances as much as we think it does So if we depend on, you know, what the government does or doesn't do, or what the rules are now, or even whether we have a job or not, those are all outside circumstances. We can't depend on that for our inner joy. And we all tend to do that. (laughs) So I know I myself do as well. So uh, when I learned this strategy, it made all the difference, especially when I had friends to talk about it with and reinforce it with me. So really, we have to be happy already. And then we can think of creative ways to raise money in order to go on the vacation. Okay, so that's the be, do, have. So I, as a parent, I'll, I'll give you a personal example because I, I, my husband and I are here at home. He's recently retired. And A few years ago, he was dreaming. He's been a sailor, by the way, ever since he was little. And he's never really been able to afford like a big boat or anything. But he thought, oh, wouldn't it be nice just even to celebrate my retirement to go rent a boat for our family, a cruise boat that we could live on for a week, day and night. And we could go in and out of these beautiful channels. And and, uh, so he, he thought, he researched it and Bottom line is it costs way too much money. (laughs) And at least that was his thinking right at the time. So what he did is he went to the boat show. So here in Toronto, we have a boat show every winter. And and they set up these gorgeous boats and he walked all around it and he thought, oh, I'd really want to own one. And how much would it cost? Well, that was like, (laughs) and uh, then (laughs) then he went to this, he saw this little booth outside where they were selling the boats and it was Canadian yacht charters and they rent these boats out that owners put into the program so he said to them so what kind of boat are you looking for which one rents the most and he said that that one we have one like that already and it's booked every week if you get one it'll be booked every week and so Steve um Steve thought, wow, you know, we could sail it in the shoulder season and rent it out and then pay it back over time. So, but he, he thought to him, he was in a success seminar at the time and they said, you have to be first. So he decided, what does this, I'm going to be successful already. What does a successful person do? So he did his homework and he went to the boat show and he did all his homework and he never told me about it. <laughs> and then he decided, that at the boat show after he'd done tons of homework he called me and he said margaret i'm thinking of buying a boat (laughs) and so i go what (laughs) i said first of all you'll be there every weekend because it's a lot of maintenance to have a boat secondly you have to pay for a slip at the harbor thirdly the boat's astronomical price like (laughs) it didn't make sense but he had answers to every one of those questions He said, no, if we put it in this charter program, it gets rented every week. They look after the maintenance completely year round, nothing to do with it. And we get to sail it a week in the shoulder season 
on each end. And I'm like, oh. And then I asked more questions and he had answers for all of them <laughs> because that's what a successful person does. And he knew it, right? And so we, he said, you have to come here and I want to talk to you about it and, and keep an open mind. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I went down there and long story short, we bought a boat. It's in the charter program and Perfect. we're paying it back over 10 years. We should have it paid back and um, we get to, to use it, it. Yeah. two weeks a year. So that was a really concrete example of being something first and not mm -hmm. waiting until this chain of events is done before you can be or have the result or feel the way you want. And when, because he, he um, felt successful in the beginning, he asked himself, what does a successful person do? So he was able to think of creative ways of doing something. If he hadn't been in that positive state or that empowered state in the first place, he may not have thought of all the different things that he needed to in order to end up with the boat. <laughs> no, that's a great, that's a great example. <laughs> and he was smart enough to call you first. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, <laughs> he wouldn't not. I mean, that, there would know. be no, he would be living on the boat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that would not have worked. <laughs> well, that's a great so, example. That's the bead you have. <laughs> I think um, my last point, I guess, for, for our listeners would be to, to have an attitude of gratitude. And it can be so challenging right now, especially in these unpredictable times where every new rule of impacts us as parents, right? And as mm -hmm. teachers too, like you're, you're working virtually, you're working in class, you're working hybrid, you're, oh my goodness. So it's crazy making right now. And, um, but I think we still have a lot to be grateful for. A lot of times they say, you know, keep a journal, like in the morning, what are the three things that you're looking forward to getting accomplished? My husband and I talk about it like the one thing, one thing that's the big frog and put your, that's the big frog is what you are not looking forward to doing. So the big frog gets accomplished first. And then we talk about it later. Like what, what was your big frog today? You know, did you do it yet? So there's a little bit of praise coming your way if you did it. And if you didn't, there's encouragement right? You can still do it. When, when is it on your calendar? But the bottom line is at the end of the day, what are you grateful for? If you got your big frog done, great. Be grateful for that. But I'm grateful that it's spring and the leaves are out and, and it's creative time and the bees are out and the, there's new life and new life brings new hope and new promise. I'm grateful that my son is coming home for the long weekend. Thanks. I'm grateful that, you know, we're healthy. I'm grateful that I booked my, my vaccine. I'm grateful, whatever you can be grateful for. We have food on the table. We have tons of leftovers so I don't have to cook tonight, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really important if we, we state that either in a journal, I have a prayer life. So I state it out, out. But I think we need to hear ourselves or see ourselves um, think it because that is reinforcing and catch our thoughts if they're negative turn them around if they're negative oh it sucks that we have to have lockdown all this time well yeah and i'm making the best of this lockdown exactly right do you or your child struggle to keep focus or keep still when i was in school even sometimes today still in meetings i can sometimes struggle to keep focus in school, I was the one who chewed my pencils and later my pen caps. MMC's line of products includes sensory tools for all ages. I can say even today as an adult that fidget tools help me to keep focus and avoid distractions. Check out the full product line and back to school specials at mymmc.ca. That's mymmc.ca. Now, I I'm curious, just given, you know, you had a, obviously a 35 year teaching career and, you know, upon retirement, did you, did you plan on getting into what you're doing now or did it just kind of happen organically? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I've been doing this part-time and teaching part-time for a lot of years. And then still, when I finished teaching with the school board, I still spent six months wondering if this is what I should do. I re-questioned everything. 
And then I thought, well, this is a no brainer. I'm at the peak of my career. I've, I can help so many teachers and students. So I thought, yeah, after six months, I realized, no, I have to, I have to do this. I feel it as a calling. I'm at the peak of my career, you know, so many people and we had children late. So you know, Patrick's only 25. So, and he's not married or has kids yet. And I think I don't want to be one of those young, healthy, energetic, retired teachers who knit and long for grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> That's just not me. Yeah. So, you know, I think I, I really believe this is a calling for me and I'm getting reinforcement for that. You know, like I'm getting people saying, I can't believe what you offer. It's so practical. Mm -hmm. It's like teaching numeracy and literacy. I had a teacher say, you know, the way you teach social and emotional learning, and it's so much fun because I put it in the context of a story. And I often teach it through the arts and teachers don't know how to teach the arts, especially drama and dance. And to children, those are natural expressions and ways of learning. So the engagement level goes woof, and you could teach almost anything that way. And that's what I have developed over a, not a whole lot of years, actually. That's yeah. great. And yeah. I like the fact that you work with parents as well mm -hmm. as the educators, right? So can you just share a little bit about what you do if you were going in, you know, pre-COVID, if you were actually going into the school um, with the teachers, what would the, the workshop seminars include? Um, it depends on the seminar, but if I do like uh, a seminar or a workshop I, um, on social emotional development, it's usually a three hour session, but I now do it in an hour mm -hmm. <laughs> virtually, <laughs> but I, I have, I love working in a, in a kinesthetic way. So, you know, I will have teachers do exercises like make two lines and this is like a little diagnostic or a little self-assessment and I'll ask some questions and all they have to do is walk across the floor if it's true for them and so I'll ask them questions like are you ever late for school if you are walk across the floor do you follow up with people who you are you on time with things um, do you follow up with people that you're you've made a commitment to or do you change your mind because something more interesting came along. So this set of questions is specifically for having them figure out if they have integrity and what that might look like. And I did it with, I did it with one, one school and the principal watched and go, no, that person's late all the time. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, oh, I don't know. <laughs> If you want to, if you want to cross that or walk that line, literally. Well, the fun part is once they do that, then I teach them all about integrity and it's stuff that most people don't know and don't realize, and they don't realize the impact of their lack of integrity. And we all mm. lack integrity. And that's the conclusion at the end of that exercise. We are all out of integrity every day. And then that was the introduction to the make it right formula. How do you make it right with someone? Like, not, don't say a flippant, I'm sorry, and don't get your kids to say it to someone else. It doesn't mean a thing. So I teach the make it right formula. And then they can teach their students the make it right formula, which is so much more impactful, so much more impactful. And it changes, it changes people. And that's what you want. Mm -hmm. You don't want people to not really get the impact. And the make it right formula focuses on the impact of your actions or lack of actions, the impact of breaking your word, the impact of not doing what, what was expected and then not saying anything about it. There is, there's a way to keep your integrity intact, even though it goes out constantly. If we push ourselves as adults or even as children, our integrity is out a lot. And then we have to take responsibility for putting it back in. And that's the make it right formula. So I don't leave teachers stranded. I was just <laughs> telling you that the no, introduction sure. was the purpose <laughs> was to make them realize, oh, I need to restore integrity sometimes too. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. 
No, that's great. So just in wrapping up, I mean, I took some great notes. So I thank you for that. This has Mm -hmm. been beneficial to me. What are you working on right now? And where can we find you online? Well, thank you. Um, You can find me at creativeeducationinaction.com. So that's my website. And there's a contact sheet there. You can contact me. You can sign up for Deep Learning at Home right now. If you want, it's free. You just have to sign up. And uh, that's the, I called it that because I want parents and children to be able to know how to speak to each other in a meaningful level. And there's affirmations uh, in each level so that if you repeat it to yourself, it'll help with that, developing that positive mindset. And it's a good affirmation for the whole family. I also have, if you're interested, you can contact me. I have uh, a free PDF called 20 Ways to Deal with Stress and Overwhelm. So I can send it to you if you contact me through creativeeducationinaction.com. And um, yeah, there's, there's webinars. There's a nine-week program for parents. And what I'm working on right now is really getting social and emotional learning in schools mostly. And I think if the parents were part of that, the whole environment would change because mm-hmm. we, we address the parents, the children, the teachers, the staff, and it ripples into society. And I have a program for people in the workplace and how to make their teams fully productive. And it's really all the similar types of things, only the conversation is different, but the strategies are similar. And then we can change, we can change society and uh, we can have more connection with one another. We can have grace with one another. We can have a basic understanding and we can respect each other. I believe we are, we are made without imperfection. It's not to say we don't behave in ways that are stellar all the time, but I believe that we need to assume that others are always doing, they're doing their best. Um, And if we were in their situation um, and come from the same background and we may be reacting the same way as that person is. So rather than hold judgment, we need to go and be curious ask you know I'm really wondering about this and and ask in a state of calm of course so yeah so so that's I love doing the workshops with the with the teachers I do a lot of conferences I'm being interviewed for a summit in New Zealand again uh, in a week I'm writing uh, I'm co-authoring a book with Brian Tracy and it's called Emerge Be the Unmistakable Leader in Your Field and my chapter is about emotional intelligence in the workplace. Uh, that's awesome. And I, I just want to make sure that we don't miss this. But the one thing that you said there was just around, you know, understanding our our own intentions. I feel like a lot of times we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt, but we don't do that for other people. Like we understand our own intentions, but you know, and going back to something you said earlier, through our own lens, we're assuming what other people's intentions are and don't necessarily extend that same grace to them. That's true. And, and, you know, to be fair, like I'm a human too, I get it. Like, it's really hard to extend grace constantly over and over to the same person when you, when in the back of my mind, there's judgment, you know, and, and that we need to get rid of, we need to abolish that because there's, when you have a deep conversation with someone and, and both of you are calm, you usually do get to the root and it's deeper than the reaction in the, in the moment. So there's something going on underneath. Like you, you, like you said, and I'll kind of paraphrase, but just assume that they're doing their best and something just yeah. didn't work out. Exactly. Yeah. They heard it. They heard it through their lens and you don't know what that is. So that's something to explore, right? Once both people are calm. Great. Well, again, very helpful conversation. And uh, we thank you for taking the time to come on today, Margaret. And also thank you for um, just sharing all the resources that you have on your website. And I know when we've talked in the past, you've sent stuff to me. So thank you for that and just making it available for parents and educators to um, access as well. You're welcome. There's a lot of reading in the blogs too, if parents are into reading um, and teachers. A lot of it I wrote for teachers, but they're applicable to parents too. Oh, great. Well, thanks again so much. Thank you so much for having me.
Thanks for listening to the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. For more ways to listen, connect with us on social media. To be a guest or to partner with us, check out our link tree at Disrupt the Everyday. Join us next time for more ways to disrupt the everyday. Thank mm-hmm. you.